Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. So I'm going to read a little bit here, and then we'll pray and ask the Lord to guide our minds as we open this up. Verse 7. So Adam and Eve have both eaten of the fruit, and the Bible says the eyes of both were opened. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And this we're going to leave off on verse 14 and 15, but let this sink into your hearts. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, <coughs> hatred, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And if you want to write in the margin of your Bible, in verse 15, that is the first time we explicitly see the gospel. Okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not the first place you see the gospel. You see it in Genesis 3.15. I'm going to break that open for you tonight. And you're going to see the hope of the Lord even back at the beginning of our failure. Who's thankful that God delivers hope the second you sin? Amen? We don't have to wait it out. He delivers hope the second we sin. Okay. Let's pray over this word, and then let's dig in. Jesus, thank you for every person that's here. I pray every time we meet, Lord, I always pray that you will bring the exact people to this place that you want to be here. So I know nobody's here by accident. I know we all need to hear something. I sense the presence of your Holy Spirit here. I know the enemy came hard against me today. I'm sure he's come hard against many who are here because when we're serious about you, man, the devil is serious about us. And that's okay because I want to give my life away to you, Jesus. And if the devil's going to dog me every day that I live because of what I do, that's okay. Because 70 or 80 years of trouble and difficulty and then flying away to Jesus, well, that'll be enough for me. So, Lord, I pray in your name that you open up your precious word to us tonight and change us from the inside out. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Remember, we left off. This is a little bit of overlap. Didn't I show you the fig leaves last week? And we were cracking up about this, you know, them getting out the sewing machine, sewing the fig leaves, how quickly they'd fall off, you know. So that was uh, a dumb thing to try to do. But they tried to cover their own sin. And that is what we all try to do. When we fall into sin, we mostly try to hide, we mostly try to cover, right? It doesn't work. Because here's what the next verse says. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So, even though they were covered with their great fig leaf attire... When God came, what did they still do? They still hid. Because nothing that we in our humanness ever try to do to cover our sins will ever suffice. Amen? You can't give enough in the offering. You can't teach enough Sunday school classes. You can't help enough old ladies across the street to hide your sin. You can't do it. So it didn't work. Now, here's the part that struck me when I was reading this just the other day. They had just failed God. And the Bible says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
How many of you think that that's a merciful statement? Do you ever think about this for a minute? You would expect if God were like us, when Adam and Eve blatantly just go against him and rebel against him, what would you expect him to do? Well, I'm not coming down there and walking around like I do any other day. Those dirty, rotten... I mean, isn't that what we do? I, I, I wrote down in my notes, the mercy of God. Adam and Eve have just blatantly betrayed him, and he comes walking in the garden, keeping himself accessible to them. That's mercy. Because honestly, what could God have done at this point once they sinned? He could have just destroyed him right then and there. He could have completely banished them to hell right there. Could he? Absolutely he could have. How merciful that they would blatantly rebel against him. And the Bible says, and what did he do next? He came walking in the garden in the cool of the day, as it seems was his usual procedure. So that's a mercy right there. Now the other thing that I want you to ponder is this. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now when you read the word garden in the Bible, does your mind go to any other garden? What's the other famous garden we always think about? The Garden of Gethsemane. Now, who was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Laboring under our sin. Jesus. I want to ask you a question. Which person of the Godhead do you believe was walking in the garden in the cool of the day? Which person of the Godhead shows himself visibly and walks around? Isn't this something else? So start to put two and two together and think about this. Adam and Eve have just sinned. And Jesus comes walking into the garden in the cool of the day. I also put in my notes here, we must ponder how dear Jesus was thinking of the garden he would one day face in order to undo what was done in the first garden. Okay, So put yourself back there at the Garden of Eden because this is a literal event. Put yourself back there. Adam and Eve had just completely blown it. And Jesus, when did Jesus know he was going to come and die for the sins of the world? After Adam and Eve sinned? Is that when he figured that out? No. Because I was just practicing my memory verses in 1 Peter chapter 1, somewhere between verse 17 and 25. It talks about the fact that Jesus was chosen before the foundation of the world. Right? Okay, he knew he was coming eternity before this happened so he i'm sure can you imagine with tear-filled eyes jesus watches adam and eve completely rebel against him and he comes walking into a garden knowing the agony he would face in the garden of gethsemane knowing what all this would mean for his life and yet he comes walking into the garden and he chooses to grapple with that now, I put a reference up there for the Garden of Eden. You can look at that in your studies this week, Mark 14, 32 to 50. When you think about the Garden of Eden, tell me some of the things that Jesus went through in that garden as he began to really feel and carry the weight of our sin. Okay, Because his dying on the cross was not just physical pain. How many of you know the spiritual pain was worse? The spiritual pain was worse. He, he experienced separation from his Father on our behalf. So what are some of the things that the Bible tells us in the Garden of Gethsemane that it was like for Jesus? you remember anything in particular? Luke, the medical doctor, specifically brings to our attention that capillaries were bursting because the trauma and pressure in his body was so great from what he was about to go through. What else happened there? He prayed and said what? God, if there is any other way, we just remember his friends fell asleep on him. We remember what he labored under. And I just think of him walking in the Garden of Eden, putting forward, he had to in his mind, he knew where this whole thing was headed. Now, this is a picture of the Mount of Olives. And the Garden of Gethsemane is on the slope of the Mount of Olives. Is the Mount of Olives a real place in existence today? Yes, okay? This is a picture. 
People have been there. And you've got the Garden of Gethsemane over here off the slope of the Mount of Olives. Okay, I want you to have that picture in your mind for a minute and think about that. Now, Matthew Henry says of God coming into the garden after they sinned, Matthew Henry says, God came walking, not running. And let's just stop right there. Pretend you're a parent and your child has just committed the worst misbehavior you have ever seen done. I'm not even going to speak what mine was when I was about 10 years old, what I did. It was bad, okay? And when my mom found out, she came charging at me. You, you know, as a parent, you're, and you just want to run at them and wring their neck. So th this is worse than any childlike misbehavior. This is the very first people that God created just rebelling smack in his face and sinning. Matthew Henry points out that the Bible tells us he came walking, not running, not riding upon the wings of the wind, but walking deliberately as one slow to anger, teaching us when we are ever so much provoked not to be hot nor hasty, but to speak and act considerately and not rashly. There's a right time for anger, but it needs to be done in the right way. And I remember the first school I was ever a principal at, I'll never forget, the person who worked with me, my guidance counselor and my assistant, they would say, you never ran, you never yelled. But we knew the look on your face as you walked calmly and straightforward. The look on your face was somebody is about to die. Okay? But you have to reserve yourself. And I think of this, it, the, the details that we miss in the Bible, I never thought of that. He came walking into the garden. If that were me, I would have come running into the garden ready to choke them. What are you dummies doing? You ruined the whole thing. You just slapped me in the face, you know. But no, that is not God. And it is a reminder to us, if God deals with us in that way when we sin, who do we think we are to rush at somebody who sins against us? Amen? Just remember that. So, God is patient. And 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 is true. Does anybody know what 2 Peter 3, 9 says? It's a very famous verse. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So God is patient, and 2 Peter 3, 9 is true, but God does have a date set. Amen? Okay, God does have a date set. Now, why am I bringing this picture back up of the Mount of Olives and the garden? Because we're tying the garden to the garden. I want to take you to a wonderful scripture. It's in the little book of Zechariah in your Bibles. So that's toward the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. And if any of you follow me on Facebook, and if you don't, shame on you. That's okay. If you're not on Facebook, I'll forgive you. If you are and you don't like Hope and Passion Ministries, I'm coming after you. And I won't be walking. Okay, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. But if you're on Facebook, I posted about this just the other day. So, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. This is speaking of the context here. For time's sake, we're not going to read the whole thing. But the context of Zechariah 14 is the second coming of the Lord. And by that, I don't mean the rapture. Okay? I believe that the rapture will happen first, then the seven-year tribulation, then the second coming of Christ. So I'm talking the second coming of Christ when Jesus returns to put down the Antichrist and all the world powers and to set up his thousand-year millennial reign. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. If you want to knock your socks off, your friends, your kids, and your grandkids... The way to do it is connect the Bible to real geography and real history. Amen? So get on a map, get on a picture, show your kids and your grandkids and your friends where the Middle East is, ask them where the most fighting and the hot spot of the world is, and then say, oh yeah, the Middle East, then show them where that is, then show them Israel, then talk to them about the Mount of Olives, the very real place that you can go visit, 
And then turn to Zechariah chapter 14, 4 and say, listen to this. I'm going to back it up to verse 3. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. Now I got to tell you something. There's a lot of people you might not want to fight with. But when God steps up to finally fight, you no want to mess with him. Amen? God. Okay, now watch this. Verse 4. And on that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And then it goes on to explain how the Jews who have turned to the Lord at that point and are currently being oppressed by the Antichrist system, that they will flee to the valley of my mountains. And it goes on to explain how God is going to deliver his people. Then he's going to fight the battle of Armageddon and he's going to set up the millennial kingdom. Now that's an exciting piece of scripture, amen? And I told you this before, and I'm going to add it and say it again. There is no other religious or holy book, whether you're talking about the, the Bhagavad Gita for the Hindus, you know, whether you're talking about the Quran for the Muslims, whatever other holy book or scriptures that people follow, there's no other religious holy book that connects their God to actual geography and history, to real-time events and places, Okay. But God is willing to put himself out there and do that. And so I think it is incredible to understand that the same feet, now think about this for a minute, the same feet that walked in the Garden of Eden, Jesus' feet, the same feet that walked in the Garden of Gethsemane, the same feet that got nailed to the cross of Calvary right outside Jerusalem are the same feet feet that will come back with the scars still in them and set them down on the Mount of Olives and that three-tiered mountain is going to do what? It's going to bust in half as his feet settle on the mountain. Is that incredible or what? It, I can't, oh, I just, I don't know about you guys. Anybody else get chills when you think about that? The power of the Word of God? And what I'm trying to get you to see is we studied Revelation for two and a half years. We're now in Genesis for about eight and a half years. And we're just trying to show you that both books, the Bible is one book from beginning to end. Amen? And everything in between. So the garden, it has very special meaning. And we not only think about what Adam and Eve were thinking, I often ponder what my dear Savior was thinking in His mercy and grace to keep traversing that garden of failure knowing he was going to a garden of suffering, amen? But one day we'll come back to that same garden and split the thing in two to save his rebellious people. It's beautiful. It's amazing. So they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And I mention this because the way that this reads in Genesis 3.8 is it gives you the feeling by the way it's stated that this was kind of a normal event. You know, they were just used to hearing him come into the garden. But this time when he came, they had to hide. It was interrupted. Um, and, and this leads to what I've already kind of got you to understand. Is this simply an anthropomorphism? Like sometimes in the Bible we'll read something, God will strike you with his hand. I mean, there's verses that talk about that. Or he covers you with his wings, okay? And you know that God literally doesn't have wings, okay? Or he's not, he's not actually striking people with his hand in that particular context. But we always take the Bible literally unless we have reason not to. And the fact that God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, we don't believe that this is anthropomorphism. We believe this is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. The same Jesus Christ who was in the industrial furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The same pre-incarnate Christ who wrestled with Jacob. Remember that? When God wrestles with someone, that's Jesus, because he was literally wrestling in his hip socket was, was touched, okay? We're talking about Jesus here. Henry Morris puts it this way. This is no crude anthropomorphism. 
but a repeated or even continual theophany. Theophany, theo meaning God, the ending part P-H-A-N-Y having to do with appearance. So when you read the word theophany, that means an appearance of God. More particularly, sometimes it's called a Christophany, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-A-N-Y. Theophany, appearance of God. Christophany, appearance of Christ in particular. That's what this is. In which the word of God, Christ pre-incarnate. We know that Christ came to the earth when he was put in the womb of Mary and grew. He was incarnate, correct? What does incarnate mean? I don't want to take anything for granted. Anybody understands the word. So these are basic. Incarnate means in flesh. That's why the Bible talks about when you live carnally, you're living fleshly according to your flesh instead of according to the spirit of God within you so Jesus came to the earth incarnate right 2,000 years ago but he also made some appearances pre-incarnate before he came to earth and put himself in the womb of Mary and that's what this is a reference to so Christ pre-incarnate clothed himself in human form in order to communicate with those whom he had created in his own image. Does that make sense to everybody? This, this is a problem. This is what you got to be able to do as a teacher. You're always watching everybody and you're thinking, okay, there's a couple things going on here. Number one, they all ate way too much pasta for dinner. <laughs> Number two, they all know this like the back of their hand. They're bored stiff. Or number three, half of them don't have a clue what you're talking about. So I'm somewhere in the middle of those three things trying to figure this out. So let me just ask you, everybody, nobody's bored, are they? Okay, so you just kind of, and if you need, it's the pot. You don't even look like you eat pasta. My goodness, too many uh, protein bars, I don't know. But anyway, um, because so, always slow me down if I'm going too fast. That wouldn't take anything for granted, but. We believe this is Jesus walking in the garden. Matthew Henry says so much here. He said, it is supposed that he came in a human shape and that he who judged the world now was the same that shall judge the world at the last day, even the man whom God has ordained. Who will judge the world at the end of time? It's Jesus. A lot of people, when we think of the judgment, uh, the great white throne judgment, which is the judgment of the damned or the unsaved, we always think of God sitting on the throne. But the Bible's very clear. It is Jesus sitting on that throne. And we too as Christians will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Christ will judge the damned and Christ will judge the save. And I do want to give you biblical reference for that. I don't like to say anything and just, oh, well, that's what Shelley believes. If, I, if it's my opinion, I'll tell you it's my opinion. If it's Bible truth, I'll give you Bible reference. And that's in John chapter 5. I did a message on this. I'm sure you could Google it and find it. The title of this message was The Coming Hour, if you want to hear a whole message on this. But John 5, 22, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Okay, that's very clear, unequivocal. You get down to verse 27. God has given Jesus authority to execute judgment. Why? Because he is the Son of Man. Okay, we often refer to Jesus as the Son of God, but the title he preferred to use most of the time, Jesus called himself the Son of Man because he wanted us to know I came to identify with you. And I believe the reason the Father gives Jesus the right to judge is because Jesus is the one who paid to save you. If he's the one that died on the cross to save you and you reject that salvation and therefore need judge, who has the right to judge you? He can look at you and say, I'm the one. I paid for you. You don't want to deal with me? Well, then I'm going to deal with you. Okay, so that is a fact. So Matthew Henry has a very good point here. The one who walks into the garden, 
The one whom they have to hide themselves from is the same judge that will judge us in the future. Isn't this beautiful? Do you like seeing Jesus? But in this cold, did you have a question, Bree, or are you just no? Okay. I told her. I said, if I look over there, you better be paying attention. I see you switch seats tonight. Switched it up. There you go. New vantage point. Maybe you'll pay attention better. Your right hand person, man. They gotta be. I said, gotta set the example here. <sighs> okay. Genesis 3 8. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. What a sad state to be in. And that is the problem with all humanity today. It's the one thing that we're all fighting against. Don't you hate it when you feel distant from God? And you don't even have to be in blatant sin to feel distant from God. We're just not in his manifest presence anymore. We will be someday, but we, we fight against that. Okay, th now this is interesting. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. The question I have for you is, is it even possible to hide from the presence of the Lord? No. Now they hid themselves. The Bible's not telling a lie here. They literally ran <laughs> behind like trees. You know what I mean? I remember once when my two brothers, they were getting to be older guys, you know, teenagers. And my dad was working a lot. My mom was in charge of them. And we were all such angelic children. But, you know, every once in a while, my two younger brothers, I was never bad. But they, they would really sometimes get out of control. And one, this one day, they got off the bus or something. They were outside on the street in front of our house. And they started fighting with each other, like fist fighting. And my mom came to the door, and she was like, you don't stop that, your father's not home, you know, you know, and she's screaming, and still they go on and on and on. They go, and they keep fighting, and I'll never forget it. My mom, she went in the house and got, you know, one of those brooms you buy from the lions, like the heavy ones? She went in that house, and she got that broom. She came running out the front door. This is one of the best days of my life. <laughs> I'm standing back there on the front porch my jaw is hanging open. She goes out with that broom. She said, I told you to not to embarrass me when your father's not home. She gave him one last chance. They didn't take it. She beat them the whole way up to the house with that broom. I loved it. And I don't know why I was saying that. Is it even possible to hide from the presence of the Lord? See, it's not possible to hide from God's presence. But Oh, I know what. I think the Bible is saying that they, they did hide because they went and they ran and they tried to get away from God. But God is a lot like my mom when he's angry and you ain't getting away. You know what I mean? But they're running behind a tree. Yeah, they were running up the road, but woo, she could fly. Okay, Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12 I do want to go here. Let's take a minute and turn there. It's a familiar scripture, but this plays out well as we think about Genesis. Because we need to apply it to ourselves. You know, we're looking at this from Adam and Eve's perspective. But there's one thing that I've learned the hard way in life, and I'm still learning this lesson. When we have unconfessed or hidden sin in our lives, you cannot get away from it. Amen? You're going to have to deal with it. You can't hide from God. Psalm 139, if you look beginning at verse 7, David said this. He said, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which I hope you remember me teaching you, is an Old Testament word for the place of death. If I make my bed, if I die, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, down there with the plankton and the sharks, right? Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me up, and the light about me will become like night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. So Adam and Eve were running from the presence of the Lord stupidly, right? Because you can't get away from God's presence. And I always say this too, imagine the ludicrous nature of them hiding behind trees. So they got fig leaves on, all right? They've sewn together fig leaves. They're running around like idiots in fig leaves. And he comes in the garden, they're still hunting. 
they go and run behind trees. And I was, you know, I've always pictured they go behind a tree like this, you know. And I've said to you before, like, when I used to play hide and seek with my nephew when he was little, you know how little kids play hide and seek? You start to count. I'll be like, okay, now I'm going to count. You go hide. He goes, okay, Angela, you start to count. One, two, and there's Noah standing in the middle of the room. <laughs> you know, if I can't see you, you can't see me. That's kind of like the attitude that Adam and Eve had. I mean, how ridiculous to think you can hide behind a tree. God wasn't going to see you. Warren Wearsby said this, guilt and fear usually go together, which explains why the pair didn't want to enjoy their evening fellowship with the Lord in the garden. Shame, fear, and guilt so transformed the inner person that Adam and Eve could no longer enjoy their beautiful garden home. Now let that sink in for a minute and know that as you are witnessing to people and even dealing with your own sin, even as a Christian. I believe that there are a lot of people who live with a lot of anxiety, a lot of fears. I believe there are people who try to medicate away their guilt. Because when you are truly guilty, not false guilt, but when you are truly guilty of unconfessed sin before the Lord, guilt and shame and fear and anxiousness will always go together. And that's, if you think about the world today, most people are not saved, are they? Most people don't even admit they have sin. And how many of you read my passion point today about Brad Pitt? When that inter- I saw that on an interview. I, I, God let me catch this one piece and I went back and I Google searched the interview and I couldn't believe what he said. He said, you know, I'm getting to the age where more of my life is behind me that's in front of me and I'm starting to ponder my personal values, you know. And he says, you know, I'm learning you got to accept yourself. You got to learn to live with your regrets and carry your griefs and your loneliness. And I'm thinking basically what you just said there, buddy, is you got to learn to accept your sin. I mean, he won't use the word sin because he'll believe it. But you just accept everything you've done and you learn to love yourself that way and you just carry your own griefs. And, and of course, my mind went to Isaiah 53 where the Bible says Jesus carried our griefs for us, blah, blah, blah. But my point is the world today, so many people are lost and he just is, was in recovery from alcoholism, right? I believe so. And so people are turning to everything to cover up this guilt and this shame is really what it is at the core. I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't a Christian. I mean, I don't know what I'd do if I was still carrying the weight of my sin. But when you truly come to terms with the understanding that Jesus has forgiven you and taken the burden of your sin off of you, you can be the most lighthearted person in the world, even in the midst of your struggles, right? And it's incredible what God can do for you even as you struggle with problems, disease, whatever. So this is the core of everyone's problem is this guilt and shame. And it's seen here in the garden. Henry Morris said this, the fact that they did feel shame at what they had done showed that there was hope. When sinners feel no guilt or shame, there is no remedy except for judgment. Now this is very, very important. Because the Bible speaks that we can sear our conscience. That you can reject God's conviction so much that you kind of build scar tissue over it. You know what I mean? You become callous to Him convicting you. Never let that happen. Amen? The best thing you can do is the minute God convicts you of something, deal with it when? Five minutes down the road? You know, after you get home from work, no, deal with it right then. Because shame is actually a good thing. It's actually a healthy thing. And I've referenced Romans 3.20 there. So let's turn there for a second. So actually the fact that they hid, it was not a bad thing. It's a quite natural response to having rebelled against God. And Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, Romans 3.20 is kind of like what I was saying, people trying to work or do things to make up for their sin, like Adam and Eve tried to cover it with the fig leaves. Romans 3.20 says, For by works of the law, in other words, by works, by following Bible commands, no human being will be justified in God's sight. In other words, you can't say, well, I'm going to take the Bible and try to obey everything I possibly can, and that will make me right before God. Because first of all, Who can obey every command? I've probably broken... I was going to say three. (laughs) I've probably broken eight of the ten commandments just today. 
I, I'm serious, because Jesus said, if you look at somebody to be angry enough to say you're an idiot or a moron, then you've already murdered in your heart. You know, I've talked about this before when I used to teach Sunday school. People say, oh, well, stealing, I mean, maybe when I was a kid I stole a piece of bubble gum, but I don't, I'm not a thief. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever acted like a jerk so that you stole somebody's peace? Have you ever stole somebody's joy? Have you ever stolen 10 minutes off of somebody because you were a raging maniac? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, we have all broken the commandments. So first of all, you can't even obey enough to do that. But here's what I love. It says, since through the law, we're not made righteous through the law, but what does the law do? The law is just here to tell us how bad we are. And I remember when we were going through Revelation, didn't we go through that time when everybody was putting the Ten Commandments in their yard? Remember that? I wasn't belittling that. There's nothing wrong with displaying the Ten Commandments, but my point was this. As a Christian, you can't put the Ten Commandments out and say, this is going to help the world. Because if I put this, all the people in the world are at least going to know they should obey the Ten Commandments and the world will be a better place. First of all, nobody can obey the Ten Commandments who doesn't have Jesus. So what you should do is put out a sign about Jesus, salvation. The Ten Commandments are good because at least the discussion that should come when you're displaying the Ten Commandments is not, okay, all unsaved people, abide by these and the world would be a better place. It would be. But unsaved people don't have the ability to obey them. So what the law really is, is, hey, you know, if my unsaved friend, oh, you want to talk about the Ten Commandments? Okay, let's look at them. Let's talk about how Jesus said, I break every one of these almost every day. I mean, the only thing these laws tell me is, I'm a mess. I need somebody to fix this for me. Okay, that's what the law is for. So when we have shame, when people have guilt, when they're introduced to the Bible and the law, that's why you don't take your Bible and pound unsaved people over the head and say, can you believe what they're wearing? Can you believe the way they talk? Can you believe what they're doing? I want to shake that Christian and say, what do you expect from them? They're not redeemed. Right? We don't have the ability to overcome sin without who? Without Jesus. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, so the shame and the guilt is a good thing. The law is a good thing because it shows us how bad we are. Adam and Eve knew. God said, do not eat from that tree. For the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And how many of you think that even though Adam and Eve didn't know what death was up till this point, that they knew the second they ate, they felt naked and ashamed. They thought, wow, death is pretty bad, isn't it? You know, because their relationship with God had immediately died. And they hid themselves among the trees of the garden. Now, I always laugh and make fun of how you would go and try to hide behind a tree. But interestingly, I'm hiding behind a tree for my salvation. Does anybody get the double meaning? Yeah. I'll never forget one day I was going to teach this. I think it was to a group of teenagers a couple years back, and I started pondering that. And I thought, why did they hide among the trees of the garden? This is my opinion. I personally believe that God used this as an allusion to what we would truly hide behind. Now, they were unsuccessful in hiding behind just everyday trees. But isn't it interesting that 1 Peter 2.24 the Bible says Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Now, I know that the cross that he died on was not like a literal tree standing there, but all wooden crosses were made of what? It was made of wood. It was made of a tree. And sometimes the Bible references the cross as a tree in that sense. And so what a beautiful picture. Adam and Eve try to hide behind literal trees in the garden, and yet I... I'm hiding behind the cross of Calvary for my salvation. Isn't that beautiful? So I do believe there's like a deep illusion going on there, which is really inspiring. Okay, so they're hiding behind trees, and it's kind of like when my nephew, you know, we'd be playing hide and seek, I'd get to 10, and there he was standing in the middle of the living room with his hands over his face. And uh, what would I still do? What do you think I did? You think I just looked at Noah and started laughing and said, you're right in the middle of the room, dummy. You know, no, what did I do? Where, where are you? Noah, where are you? Okay, listen. Did God know where Adam and Eve were at this point? Okay, he knew where they were. 
But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Why do you think he did that? It was more about them than it was about him. Which is the same reason parents do that. And we'll get to this in a minute. First of all, the Lord God called to the man. Matthew Henry. This inquiry after Adam may be looked upon as a gracious pursuit in kindness to him and in order to his recovery. If God had not called to him, this is very touching to me, if God had not called to him to reclaim him, his condition would have been as desperate as that of the fallen angels. This lost sheep would have wandered endlessly. If the good shepherd had not sought after him to bring him back, and in order to remind him where he was, where he should not be, and where he would not be either happy or easy. The Bible says in the book of Romans that there is no one righteous, no, not one. And it even says in the book of Romans that there is no one who seeks after God. Did you know that's in the Bible? Read Romans 3. And sometimes we think, oh, it's to my credit that I'm saved because, you know, I mean, it, I, at least I came to God and got saved. Is that true? Listen, picture yourself as Adam and Eve. If you want to understand how salvation works, go back to the garden. We are sinners and we are lost. And when you are a sinner and you are lost, what do you do when God's around? What do you do? You run, you hide from God. Maybe not literally, but you try to cover yourself and you try to hide. When you are in sin against the Holy God, you're not running towards Him. Does everybody understand that? So when Adam and Eve sinned, it wasn't they who like came, you know, you, we don't hear, and, and suddenly Adam decided to pop from behind one of the trees and say, um, over here, Lord, I, I need you. Is that what happened? No. Who initiated this? God. That's why Jesus said, uh, I don't know the exact reference, but in the Gospels, Jesus says, Father, all that you have brought to me, I will keep. I will take care of them. God has to call a person to salvation. Amen? And this is why some of us get so frustrated trying to see our loved ones and our friends saved. We pray and we pray and we pray and we pound them with the word of God and we keep telling them and telling them and telling them and they don't get saved and we're like, what's wrong? I'm going to tell you what's wrong. You ready? Holy Spirit hasn't called them yet. But that doesn't mean he's not going to. You cannot shirk your responsibility to keep casting your bread on the waters. Keep telling them the truth. Keep giving them the word of God. Because the second the Holy Spirit comes and calls to them and quickens their heart, everything you said is now going to come into play. Amen? And he himself will draw them. So don't get frustrated. And don't think that it's all for naught, because when God's ready to do it, he's going to do it. And God's the one who initiates it. Isn't that a beautiful thought? So in the garden, just like today, a person is saved. And I love this. I love what Matthew Henry said. You know, God never gave Satan and the fallen angels a chance to be redeemed, did he? When they sinned, he said, get out of here. Hell is prepared for you. But when Adam and Eve sinned, what did God do? He wasn't going, where are you? You know, to, in order to damn them, he was saying, Adam, where are you? You were supposed to be here with me, walking with me. Where did you go? In order to prompt Adam to think, man, where am I? I'm not where I should be, but at least God's still calling to me. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And I know we have to leave off there. Is there anybody who has a question or a comment about anything tonight? Bria, go ahead. You've taught me to think about the inverse. So when he had to ask, where are you? The normal probably every time they heard him walk was to run to him. Ooh. And I thought how beautiful that would have been and how scary that would have felt immediately now this first time they didn't want to go to him. And it makes me think about like when we know we sin, when we're in sin, this passage makes me just think we should just run to him immediately and yes. ask for forgiveness, not try to run and keep hiding from it. And yes, amen. I don't know. I That's just, very I love good. That. I like that you thought of the inverse. That is that is interesting. They probably did always run to him, and I just feel like the Holy Spirit saying this as we, uh, you know, close to pray or pray to close, whatever way you want to look at it. 
it's not just when you're unsaved that you need restored fellowship. You, you certainly need it then because you need to be redeemed. But so many of us Christians can be living in known sin. And we just refuse to deal with it. Your heart's going to grow hard. And you aren't going to be running to Christ the way you should. And you're not going to be as effective for his kingdom. And you may still get to heaven, as Corinthians tells us, by the skin of your teeth because you trusted in Christ. But you're going to watch a lot of your life go up in smoke when you reach the judgment seat of Christ. Because you did not have fellowship with God as you were intended to. And you're missing a lot of joy and a lot of freedom. So 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? And if we say that we have no sin, what does the Bible say we are? We're a liar. And we miss out on fellowship with him. So as we pray, let's just put ourselves in Adam and Eve's place and say thank you, Jesus, for showing us with the first man and woman what the makeup and the nature of each of us is. And by looking at this scenario in the garden, we can picture, we can see in our mind's eye how it is that you deal with broken, lost sinners. And it's a beautiful thing, God. I thank you that even when we run, even when we hide, you come walking, not running, not striking at us. You come walking. You come showing us that you want back the fellowship that we always had. And you call out to us. So, Lord, as we prepare our hearts to come back next week and learn more, I pray that this week, we would be able to share this truth with someone we care about, someone we know. Help us to ponder it, to think it through. And I pray right now in Jesus' name that if there be anyone in this room who still has not asked you to be the Savior of their soul, maybe they thought through some type of works or goodness or obedience to the law they could be saved, but they've never asked you to forgive them knowing there's nothing we can do. Let that happen, Lord. And for those of us who do know you, if there is anything that has come between us and you, let us confess it. Let us run back into your arms. Take that weight and that guilt from us as we trust the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for the truth, dear Lord. Thank you for justice. In Jesus' name.